So I stated our goal for the moment as being to solve systems of linear equations. And I've outlined the general method we're going to use to tackle that goal, which is to start with the system we want to solve, perform a series of allowable steps. That's the three things we named at the end of class yesterday, swapping equations, multiplying by a constant, or multiplying by a constant and adding to another equation. And doing this until we get a system that is in some way simple enough for us to solve. Well, the sort of re, um, the thing that makes linear algebra an actual field of mathematics instead of a trick that you learn in two days during some other math course was the realization that we could study systems using another kind of object called matrices. And that's what we're now going to introduce. Systems of linear equations are fundamentally complicated beasts. They've got a bunch of variables in them. They've got a bunch of addition and subtraction. They've got equalities. They can be true. They can be false, depending on what values you plug into the variables. It's a lot easier to work with matrices. That's, uh, that's the plural, the singular is a matrix. A matrix is just a rectangular array of numbers. So it doesn't have all of the complications that a system has. There's no question about whether a matrix is true or false for a specific value of X, Y, and Z. For example, a matrix just is. So giving an explicit example, numbers arranged in a rectangle. And matrices are enclosed with square brackets, or they're enclosed with open parentheses. And unlike interval notation, where square brackets and open parentheses mean different things, this is just totally down to the personal preference of whoever's writing the matrix. The notation doesn't matter. This is a matrix. This is a matrix. Getting a few elements three definitions down right away. A matrix has horizontal rows and vertical columns. 
And you see matrices can be of different sizes. This matrix has two rows and three columns. This matrix has two rows and two columns. We gave the dimension of the matrix. And it's important to get the order of the straight. The dimension is the size, and it's given as the number of rows cross the number of columns. So this matrix here has two rows and three columns. This matrix here as two rows and two columns. And as I say, the dimension of the matrix is going to come up frequently. So make sure you get that order down. Matrices are traditionally, although not always, given names that are capital letters from the beginning of the alphabet. So, you know, you have these conventions, functions are often called F, G, H, variables X, Y, Z. Matrices are most often capital A, capital B, capital C. And assuming that we're using this notation, we can refer to a specific entry of a matrix using very standard notation. Like, you see this matrix has a one there. Suppose I want to refer to that one. Well, we switch from uppercase to lowercase. In the subscript, this one is in the second row, comma, the second column. So the entry in the second row and the second column of this matrix is one. If we fold that B, and we wanted to refer to this. Let's not actually do four. If we wanted to refer to this uh, five, it's in the second row, third column. So that's all a matrix is. But their very simplicity is what causes them to have so many applications. Um, matrices are used everywhere in computer programming, like an image file is going to be stored as a matrix for the row and the column identify pixels, and then there's a color code as an entry that tells you how that pixel should be colored. In my grade book, I have your names and I have all of the assignments and that's being stored internally as a matrix. But for now, we want to look at a specific application of matrices called augmented matrices. And the point behind this application is that matrices can be used to store linear systems. So to sort of get at that, let's look at the system 2x plus 2y equals 0 
y equals five. So we don't yet have a method for solving systems, but I reckon we can figure this one out. Y has to be one, and if Y is one, then two, then negative two plus two is zero. So the solution to this system is negative one, one. I intentionally selected a system that would be easy to solve in my head. And if you now look at two x one, plus two x two equals zero, x two equals zero. Well, the solution is still negative one, one. I mean, I'm calling my variable something different, x1 and x2 instead of x and y, but that's not changing anything that matters about the system. It's still got the same solution. And that sort of um, raises the question, if the variable name doesn't matter, what does matter? And the answer is the coefficients matter. We've got two times our first variable plus, so positive two times our second variable equals zero. In the bottom equation, we have zero times our first variable plus one times the second variable. Sorry, I uh, you can, if you notice some an error, you can always just yell at me or raise my hand. Um, zero times our first variable, one times our second variable equals one. So the part about this equation that the system that matters, the part of it that's actually affecting the solution set can be stored as a rectangular array of numbers. And that's exactly what a matrix is. So this system can be stored as a matrix. And when a system is stored as a matrix, that matrix is called an augmented matrix. Tricks. I'll get to the word augmented in just a moment. So just one more brief example. 2x plus y minus z equals 1. x plus z equals two. Let's say we have the system and we want to store it as an augmented matrix. Equations turn into rows. So two equations, two rows. Variables change into columns. So there's going to be an X column, a Y column, a Z column. There's also going to be an equality column for these numbers on the right. And now we just read along. 
two X plus one Y minus one Z equals one. One X, make sure to include any zero terms, zero Y plus one Z equals two. And there's the augmented matrix. And the reason this matrix is called augmented is this last column. All of the columns but one correspond to variables. And then you have that last column that is something different. It's corresponding to the numbers on the right of the equal sign. And what you sometimes see in textbooks and resources is because this vast column um, is playing a different role from the other columns, you sometimes see it separated from them with a dotted line. Um, our textbook doesn't do that, so I didn't do it in our online notes, but sometimes I do it when I'm lecturing, if I want to emphasize that the last column is different from the other columns. And just like we can go from a system to a matrix, tricks. If we have an augmented matrix, we should be able to go from that to the system. The only thing we lose here is that we don't know what to call, we have to decide, I guess I should say, what to call our variables, whether it's x and y or x1 and x2 or something else that isn't stored in the augmented matrix. But once we decide that, if we call our variables x and y, let's say, then 1x minus y equals 0 comes from the first row, 2x plus 5y equals 1, that comes from the second row. And there's your system of linear equations. And this, now that we have this down, this is going to sort of modify our solution method. So let's go way back. We're going to actually do something a little different here. Let me. We're going to start with the system we want to solve, sure enough. But instead of messing with that system, we're going to store it as a matrix. Then we're going to mess around with the matrix until we get a matrix that is in some way simple. And then we're going to convert back from the simple matrix to a simple system. And the ease of working with matrices as opposed to working with systems is going to fully compensate us for the relatively minor steps of going from here to here and going from here to here. 
But I need to say something more about this step. Well, I have to say many things about this step, but most immediately, at the end of class yesterday, I gave things you could do to change a make a system. I gave you steps you could use to go from here to here. Now that we're working with matrices, we need something similar. What are we allowed to do to a matrix? And the answer to that question is going to be very similar. The elementary row operations are exactly the three things I said we could do to a system, except every mention of the word equation is going to be swapped with row. So we can interchange the rows of a matrix. We can multiply a row by a non-zero constant. And we can multiply a row by a constant. and add it to another row. And I kept using the word can there. We can do this, we can do that. That requires a bit of comment because I said, for example, that we use matrices to store student grades and probably you don't want me to take the row that corresponds to your grades and multiply it by a half. You, what do I mean when I say we can do these things? To augmented matrices are row equivalent if we can turn one into the other using these elementary row operations. And now remember that augmented matrices correspond to systems of linear equations. So this, this terminology is maybe slightly sloppy, but you can think of elementary, you can think of augmented matrices as having solutions. 
systems, right? Because the, they correspond to systems of linear equations and those systems of linear equations have solutions. So with that sort of comment made, I hope this makes sense. Equivalent or row equivalent, we do sometimes get sloppy and just not bother with the row part. Equivalent, augmented matrices. have identical solution. Sets. So once again, flipping way back to the beginning, the things we're going to do to this matrix to make it a simpler matrix are the elementary row operations. And because of what I just said, that two row equivalent augmented matrices have the same solution sets, that means that this system and this simple system have the same solution sets. And we can solve this simple system, and it's the same as solving the more complicated system. Time for some definitions. I keep using words like simple and I haven't been defining them. We need to do that. And actually simple, there are sort of multiple definitions we're going to give for what it means for a matrix to be simple. Let's start with row echelon form. I might occasionally be sloppy and just talk about echelon form because I've never heard of such a thing as column echelon form. This is the only echelon form I know about. But a matrix, and this matrix doesn't have to be augmented. This definition works for any matrix. Tricks, but a matrix is in row echelon form if it satisfies two or three conditions, depending on how you want to count. First condition. Any row of all zeros is below any non zero row. So, for example, a matrix that is not in row echelon form would be that. 
because you see we have that row of all zeros and it is not, and we have a row that contains non-zero elements. And to be in row echelon form, this row needs to be below this row. For the next two properties, we're going to need a quick supplemental definition. The leading entry of a row is its first non zero entry. Reading from left to right. So this is a leading entry. It's the only leading entry the matrix has. This top row doesn't have a first non zero entry. Now, going back to the sort of primary definition we're looking at. All the entries below a leading entry must be zero. If a matrix is to be in row echelon form. So again, looking at examples of matrices that are not in row echelon form, Here's a matrix that isn't because this one is a leading entry. And you'll notice that below this leading entry is a non zero term. This four is not to zero. Let's call this two A. The leading entry of any row is strictly to the right of the leading entry in the row above it. So once again, referring to this example, one is a leading entry and four is a leading entry and four is not to the right of one. So that's another way you can see that this matrix is not in row echelon form. And actually two and two A, they're listed as separate requirements in the textbook without comment, but those are mathematically equivalent. Every matrix that satisfies this property satisfies this property and vice versa. So it's really only two requirements. This requirement one, and then whichever one of these two you prefer. And the third, if we have one of these, we'll get the third automatically. 
But that's row echelon four. And for now, row echelon form is going to satisfy our definition of simple. In the sense that if an augmented matrix is in row echelon form, we can solve the corresponding system. Let's look at an augmented matrix. That was supposed to be a one. So here's an augmented matrix. It's in row echelon form. You see, there are no rows of all zeros, so we don't have to worry about that. Our leading entries are this one, this two, and this two. And you see they're going to the right as we read down. This is to the right of this. This is to the right of this. We, um, let's call the variables we're working with x, y, and z. You can solve the corresponding system by starting at the bottom and working up. So this last row corresponds to 0x plus 0y plus 2z equals four. Of course, we can ignore a zero times x, that's zero, and zero times y is zero, and we're left with two z equals four. And that lets us find z. Going up a row, 0x plus 2y plus z equals 1. So again, the 0x is just 0. That can go away. And we've got plus z, and we know what z is. We know that z is 2. So this equation becomes 2y plus 2 equals 1. And that lets us solve for y. 2y equals negative 1. y equals negative 1 half. And now we just keep going up. x plus y plus z equals zero, but we know what y is. It's negative one half. And we know what z is. It's two. Let's write that as four halves. So x plus y plus z, that's x plus 3 halves equals 0, x equals negative 3 halves. So we found x and y and z. And any augmented matrix in row echelon form is simple enough that we can do this. Start at the bottom, work up, solve the system that way. 
there's an even simpler form, but for now we'll be satisfied with this. And going further we get in, the more scrolling this is, but going back to um, this sort of aspirational chart that we've created, we now know what we mean when we talk about a simple matrix and we know what steps we're allowed to perform to go from here to here. All that remains is, okay, we know what steps we're allowed to perform, but what steps should we perform? What do we have to do to go from a complicated matrix to a simple matrix? It is now time to present Gaussian elimination. The Gauss family is a major name in mathematics and science. I can't say offhand which of the Gausses is being credited here. There were quite a few of them. So what does Gaussian elimination do? Well, it takes a matrix as its input and it spits out a row equivalent matrix in row echelon form. And Gaussian elimination always works. Every matrix is equivalent to a matrix in row echelon form. There is no risk that this is going to give us a division by zero error or otherwise break in any way. We can always do this. And Gaussian elimination is very difficult to talk about if you're trying to do it in a completely abstract setting. I think it will help immensely if we talk about it in terms of a concrete example. Let's take this matrix and let's perform Gaussian elimination on it, presenting Gaussian elimination as we go. So we're going to start by working with the leftmost column of the matrix. And we need that top entry to be something other than zero. So remember that one of our elementary row operations is that we can swap rows. If necessary, swap rows. So the, what am I doing? How am I spelling so? Swap rows. So the top entry is not zero. Well, it is necessary in this case, because currently our top entry is zero. 
And it doesn't matter which rows you swap, you just need to get rid of that zero. So you could swap the first and the second row, or you could swap the first and the third row, whatever works to get rid of that to zero. I am going to swap the first and third row. So two, three, one, zero, four, two, one, one, zero, two, three, negative one. And now this next step is simple to say, but requires a lot of comment maybe to clarify it. We have a non and zero entry in the upper left. So step two is going to be to use this non zero entry to turn everything below it to zero. So, well, how do we do that? We'll talk more about that in just a moment. For now, what are we doing? Well, remember, we're trying to get a matrix in row echelon form. And one of the requirements of being in row echelon form is that all of the entries below a leading entry have to be a zero. Well, this two is a leading entry. It's the first non-zero num entry in the first row. So everything below it has to be zero to be in row echelon form. And that's why we are doing this. How do we do it? We always do it using the same row operation. Let me see if I can find them, here we are. This third row operation, where you multiply a row by a constant and add it to another row, is how we always perform these elimination steps. Let's see this in practice. Let's use this two to get rid of this four. And I'm going to be, I don't have a dry erase marker and there appear not to be any. So sorry for, I'm going to sort of flash back and forth between slides while I copy this over. Two, three, one, zero, four, two, one, one. Zero, two, three, negative one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the first row by something and add it to the second row in order to turn this four to zero. So I'm going to add something to the second row in order to turn four 
into zero, what am I going to add? Well, to turn four to zero by addition, I need a negative four. So I need to multiply this first row by something. And in particular, I need to multiply this first row by something that will turn this two here into a negative four. So how do I use multiplication to turn this two into a negative four? Well, I must be multiplying the first row by negative two. So if I multiply the first row by negative two, this two turns to negative four, this three turns to negative six, the one turns to negative two, the zero keeps being zero. And if I multiply the first row by negative two and add it to the second row, my new second row is zero, negative four, negative one, one. If we had anything except zero here, I'd have to do the same thing a second time. Like if we had a three here, I'd have to turn the three to zero, but we already have a zero. So now I'm done with that first column. I'm done with that first row. And now we just sort of repeat the process. We go down and to the right, and we see a negative four is now our upper left term. If this were zero, we'd swap rows to make it non-zero. It isn't, so we don't have to do that step here. And we use this negative four to turn this two to zero. So we're going to multiply the second row by something, and we're going to add it to the third row with the intention of turning that two to zero. So that must be a negative two. If we're going to add and turn this two to zero, two plus negative two is zero. So we need to multiply the second row by something. And in particular, we need to multiply the second row by a number so that this negative four turns into negative two. Now that's one half, negative four times one half is negative two. Zero times one half is still zero. Negative one times one half, negative one half. Positive one times one half is positive one half. Let's see, three minus one half. I mean, it's 2.5, but that's three is six halves. Let's write this as a fraction as five halves. And 
the negative one plus one half is negative one half. And there's our new third row. And we keep doing this until we're done, until we are in row echelon four. We keep going down and to the right. We're now done with the first row and the second row. And we're done with these columns that are all zero. And now if this matrix were larger, we'd keep going. We'd now use this five halves to turn everything below it to zero. But we're done. I mean, there isn't anything below it. This matrix is in row echelon form. Clear those out. It's in row echelon form because, well, because there aren't any rows that are all zeros. So we get that condition automatically. And if you look at the leading entries, they go strictly to the right. Or equivalently, if you look at the leading entries, everything below this two is zero, everything below this negative four is zero, and trivially, because there isn't anything below it, everything below five halves is zero. And that's Gaussian elimination. It can be a little tedious, um, and certainly, I mean, certainly if you have a big or even a reasonably sized matrix, like a 10 by 10 matrix or something, there is no thought of doing this by hand. And we'll early next week, we'll learn how to do all this on a calculator, but you ought to know the process of Gaussian elimination. It's a very fundamental algorithm. You might notice, by the way, um, there, to do Gaussian elimination, you might need to swap rows to make stuff non-zero. And then you have to multiply rows by constants and add them to other rows um, to eliminate stuff. There's a there's an elementary row operation that you never have to use when you're doing Gaussian elimination. And that's that it's never necessary to multiply a row by a constant. It might occasionally simplify things. Like if you have, If you have a row three, three, nine, seven, one, two, and you have to multiply three by something to make it negative seven and then add it to the second row, it might be nicer to first multiply the first row by one third. Then you'll have just one, one, three, seven, one, two, and you won't have the seven thirds or the three sevenths or whatever the fraction is that would appear if you use this three to get rid of the seven. But it's never a strictly necessary step in this algorithm. However, we're going to now 
define an even simpler kind of matrix than matrices in row echelon form, and we'll modify Gaussian elimination to put matrices in that even simpler form. And for that modified algorithm, steps like this will sometimes be necessary. However, does anybody looking at the stuff we've done already today, does anybody have any questions at this point? then I've said that if a matrix is in row echelon form, it's simple enough that we can solve the augmented, um, sorry, the corresponding system of linear equations, um, starting at the bottom and working up. But what would be really simple would be to have an augmented matrix that looks like this. This augmented matrix is in row echelon form, first of all, but it's so simple that talking about solving the corresponding system is almost, I mean, there isn't anything to solve. 1x plus 0y plus 0z equals 3 x equals 1. 0x plus 1y plus 0z equals 2. y equals 2. 0x plus 0y plus 1z equals 4. z equals 4. So this would really be nice if we could get our augmented matrix to look like this. X3. Oh, yeah, sorry. Mind seems to be wandering. A matrix will be said to be in reduced row echelon form if well, row echelon form is a pumped up version of row echelon form. So first of all, it has to be in row echelon form. Second, all the leading entries must be one. So going back to the matrix we put in row echelon form, this already isn't in reduced row echelon form because we have a two, a negative four, a five halves. These need to be one, one, one. But the really significant thing is that all the entries above a leading and 
free must be zero. To be in row echelon form, all the entries below have to be zero. To be in reduced row echelon form, so we still have that, but also all of the entries above have to be zero. And assuming that your system has exactly one solution, um, when you put the matrix in row reduced row echelon form, it will look exactly like this. One's down the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, except in the last column. So how do we put a matrix in reduced row echelon form? Well, our algorithm for doing that is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And Gauss-Jordan elimination is Gaussian elimination with some other stuff tacked on at the end. So that's again sort of illustrate this via example. Um, zero, two, three, negative one. Four, two, one, one. Two, three, one, zero. So to start with, we just perform Gaussian elimination. So let's see, we did that. Two, three, one, zero. Zero, negative four, negative one, one. Zero, zero, five halves, negative one half. And in the context of Gauss-Jordan elimination, the Gaussian elimination has a special name. It's called the forward phase. And now we're going to keep on eliminating stuff, except that, you know, when we performed Gaussian elimination, we started up here and moved down. Now we're going to start down here and move up. We'll grab the leading entry in the bottom row. And to be in reduced row echelon form, all entries above that leading entry must be zero. And that leading entry has to be one. So as far as making that leading entry one, here's where we can use the row operation, multiply a row by a non-zero constant. If we multiply this third row by two fifths, 
that will become the y. And let's see, negative one half will become negative one fifth. Now we'll stop bothering me. Good Lord, I'm sorry it's doing that. Um, and now we're going to just, as I say, Here's our leading entry. It's one, just like we wanted. Now we need everything above that leading entry to be zero. We'll make that happen using exactly the same techniques we used for the Gaussian elimination. We'll multiply this row by something and add it to the second row to turn this negative four to zero. And in particular, if we want to add something to the second row, to turn this negative four to zero, it must be four. So we're going to multiply the third row by something that turns this one into four, and we're going to add it to the second row. And to turn one to four via multiplication, well, we multiply by four. So this third row times four, the nice th this phase is a lot quicker than the Gaussian elimination because we have all of these zeros floating around. Um, we multiply the third row by four, zero, zero, four. Negative four fifths. And here is our new second row. And I am very swiftly running out of time, so I am not going to copy all of that down. I'm going to make the change here. Now we need to multiply the third row by something and add it to the first row to make um, the first, to make this entry turn to zero. So, one, we want to get rid of one. If we multiply the third row by negative one and add it to the first row, that will accomplish our goal. of turning this one to zero. Two, three. And now I'm out of time, but we just keep going up and to the left. We'll take this negative four, we'll multiply the second row by negative one fourth to turn the leading entry to one. Then we'll eliminate the three above it. Up and to the left, we'll turn this leading entry to one. There, won't, there isn't anything above it, so we'll be done. We came 
very close to finishing section 1.2. We didn't quite on it. There's like maybe 10 minutes more of lecture. We have to talk about what happens if, I mean, I've given this as a solution technique, but what happens if there are no solutions? What if the system is inconsistent? Or what happens if there are infinitely many solutions? How's that look? So I'm just going out quiet. I mean, it's hardly a secret. It's recording. But I'll quietly just change the due date for the 1.2 homework. I'm hopefully most of the online students will just finish 1.2 and they will then turn the homework in um, this weekend. You can start the homework, you can do a lot of it. There will be problems that you can't quite do yet until Tuesday when we really do finish this section out. I know that, uh, that of course from your point 